Hello, how are we doing? How's the fam? Hope you're taking care of yourself. Let's talk about the books I read in March and February. I have come prepared today. A la black coffee. <laughs> You know it's going to be a long one when I break out the black coffee. But first, let's talk about today's video sponsor, Pear Eyewear. Guys, just watch this. Are you kidding me? <laughs> There's no need anymore to wanting to find glasses that are both affordable and fun, but also practical because Pear Eyewear checks all those boxes. With Pear Eyewear, you can have high quality, affordable glasses that let you switch up your look in just a snap. Today, I'm wearing the Otis, which I picked up in clear for my base frame color. These are just such a staple that will go with any outfit. But for when I'm wanting to change up my style and add a little something extra to the fit, I can easily snap on a top frame. This frame's in the shade, the Army Green, which is just this beautiful earthy tone of green that is perfect for spring, fall. I also have the tortoise, perfect for when I want that classic type of look. Next time I'm going to the library, I'm wearing these. Now these next top frames are a game changer. These are the black sun tops from the sun top collection. I'm not proud to say that I've worn sunglasses over my normal glasses before. That's not a cute look, but these, however, fix that problem. Thank you, pair. It's giving classic Hollywood. Ooh, love it. I also love the case the glasses come with. Look how cute it is. It also has a pocket up front to keep all your top frames in, which is so handy. Pear has made their ordering process super easy and user-friendly. All you have to do is choose your base frame for $60 along with your top frame starting at as low as $25. That is an amazing deal. One of my favorite features is their virtual try-on feature, which enables you to virtually try on different pairs without ever having to step foot in a store. Such as with the glasses I have on today, you can easily add your prescription to them and make them into blue light glasses. If you also want a cute new pair of glasses and some cute new top frames to accessorize any look with, click the link in my description and use code SarahElizabeth15 for 15% off. Thank you so, so much Pair Eyewear for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to it. In March and February, I read a total of 15 books, seven thrillers and mysteries, three general fiction, three romances, one fantasy, and one sci-fi. It's been a very thriller heavy past couple of months, but my stressed out self during midterm season could not fathom picking up anything else. My mind for three days straight there was purely combining form for heart, heart cardio, cardio combining, combining form, form for, for abdomen, abdomen, abdomon, 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 no other critical abdomen. thinking was taking place <laughs> during that time. These past couple of months have truly been whiplash. We've had some five-star highs, one-star lows. Love that. Truly has represented the chaos that is my life. I started off February with reading Pink Books for my Reading Pink Books for a Week reading vlog, which you can go watch if you want a deeper take on these books. But I first picked up in that video, One of Us is Dead by Geneva Rose, which I gave four and a half stars. I feel like if you watched the Real Housewives shows, you would really enjoy this book as the snobby, catty, rich woman who clearly have too much time on their hands are the best part of this novel. This is a thriller that you read for the juicy secrets. The ending, I've seen it before. If you read a lot of thrillers, it's not going to be a shocker. Still, I was hooked from beginning to end. I loved the female dynamics and the discussion around the political power these affluent individuals have over each other. Next, I picked up Heartburn by Nora Ephron. Oh boy, <laughs> I really went at this novel in that video. I'm so done with this. This book has started to go on a repetition rampage. Please just shut up. <laughs> I'm gonna need to stop you right there. One star, good night. I gave this one star. One of the issues I had with this book was was how offensive and problematic it was. It's one thing to include problematic elements in a book and then challenge those beliefs, that's called commentary. But it's another when you include those elements and write about them in a way that makes it seem like you actually believe them. <laughs> Even if we were just to disregard all that, let's say we took all that out of the book, okay? The overall story infuriated me. Nothing really happened in here. What is this book about? Marriage? Maybe? I don't even... No, because this book took so many pointless detours that the actual plot got pushed to the side. <laughs> Don't even get me started on the repetition in here. All I will say on that is that repetition can be a very strong literary device when used sparingly. Emphasis on sparingly. This is also a movie apparently. I can't speak on that, but I hope it is aged better than this novel. The next pink book was luckily a five star. Thank God. The Lost Ticket by Freya Sampson. This book right here is a charming, endearing, heartwarming story about how a chance meeting can change the lives of many. I did not expect this book to be so insightful considering the cute little cover. I loved how this book was able to be so impactful, but also so uplifting. Like 
sad emotional stories are not the only ones that can leave an impression on you. And this is a great example of that. This novel made me reevaluate how I approach my own behavior and internal unconscious judgment. This was just the perfect feel good book. If you want a happy little story, this is it right here. I did listen to two of the Improbable Meet Cute books, one in that video and then one of my own. The idea behind this novella series is that each book revolves around Valentine's Day. I love that idea, especially for romances. Out of the two I read, if I were to just recommend one, I would definitely go with the exception to the rule. I gave it 4.5 stars, whereas the worst wingman ever I gave four. Christina Lauren either writes really good bangers or just like average books. I don't mean to offend you, Christina Lauren, but that's just how it is. And this was such a banger, okay? The exception to the rule basically revolves around an accidental email sent between strangers that leads them to develop this annual tradition of them sending each other emails on Valentine's Day and then possibly something even more. I have a strong feeling that I would have given this five stars if I didn't read it audibly as the first 50% is told entirely in emails unless you wanna hear to blah, 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 from blah, 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 every other sentence. And I'm here to tell you, you do not want that. The writing just felt very jarring. There were a few laugh out loud moments in here, not because of something funny, but rather of something cringy. This is not a very comedy heavy novel, which is definitely different for Christina Lauren as she, I, I shouldn't say she, it's two authors, they, as they tend to write more comedic than romantic books, which usually I think Christina Lauren does really well. So I was surprised by this, pleasantly surprised. Yeah, it was a little bit cringy at times, but aren't all romances? I have downloaded all the audiobooks in the series, so it's really just a matter of when I'll be in the mood to read them. Whenever I'm in the mood for something short and sweet, I guess. Next, I picked up So Happy For You by Celia Lasky for the buzzword readathon for February, which was to read a book with positive words in the title. Probably, you know, so you would pick up something uplifting something with positive vibes. Me? I chose a thriller, though I wouldn't really call it that. This felt more of like an op-ed piece against the wedding industry. I gave this three stars. It was interesting, and it definitely took a different stance than the marriage is such a momentous occasion, it's all sunshine and rainbows, seen in a lot of literature, but this painted marriage in such an overly negative point of view to the point where I just couldn't believe the author's argument. And everyone can have their own opinion, but the author would have had a stronger argument if it just didn't feel so biased. You can't just give me the bad. You need to give me the good and the bad and then disprove the good to further support the bad. And that is how an argument's made. What is this book about? In this novel, we have Robin and Ellie, best friends since childhood. Even though they've had their ups and downs, when Ellie gets engaged, she of course asks Robin to be her maid of honor. Robin, a bit reluctantly, agrees and is like, Okay, you know, I'm not really into the whole wedding thing, but since it's you, I'll be your maid of honor. Just promise me you will not participate in any of those weird wedding rituals. And Ellie is like, oh no, of course not. That's not me. But apparently to Ellie, no actually means yes, that is what I indeed will be doing. Participating in rituals that increasingly get more deadly. This felt like reading about me and my best friend, whom I've also been friends with since first grade. But if our relationship took like a really toxic turn, I kind of want to give this to her and be like, read this. I saw us in here while reading this. But she would be like, Sarah, that's concerning. No, she would actually be like, mm. Yeah, you would read something like that. The overall plot though was compelling, a bit confusing at times as I couldn't really keep the bride, all the different bridesmaids straight in my head, though my brain was also in 50 other places while reading this, so that probably did not help. It would have been nice to have gotten to know Robin's partner a bit better, so it didn't feel like she was spewing all of this, we are in this perfect relationship BS at us. You can tell me how great your relationship is, but where are the receipts? There was this one part where a character in here was having an allergic reaction. And so she just stabbed herself with an EpiPen and then went la di da about her day. And I was just waiting for her to start convulging on the floor or something. Like, girl, you were about to take your last breath a second ago. An EpiPen is not going to Uno reverse that. If you are carrying around an EpiPen and you are not two years old, you would know that. If you are against marriage, which is fine in itself, I don't get me construed But if you are against that and want to read a book that will reassure your beliefs in a not very convincing way. Here you go. I don't know why you'd want that, but there you have it. Oh my God. This next book changed my life. Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. This is the shocker of the year. Y'all know I don't read fantasy very often, but this just had that je ne sais quoi. I'm going to be dividing 2024 up by pre fourth wing and post fourth wing. If you have been a long time viewer on my channel, you would have known that I have been waiting, waiting for way longer than I sh really should have for a book to break the dams. That is my eyes. Yes, fourth wing, a book about dragons <laughs> made me cry. 
what? Give me a little life? Nah. Give me fourth wing and I'm sobbing. I actually wasn't sobbing, but still tears were shed. I gave it five stars. I would have given this six stars if I could. This book is my new obsession. All the book talk hype around it only made me more skeptical going into it. But what did they say about broken clocks? They're still right twice a day. <laughs> Sorry, book talk. I don't mean to diss you, but you've given me a lot of, a lot of bad recommendations and not just me, a lot of people. I'm sure most of you know what this is about and have read it. This like broke the internet last year. But for those that don't, this book basically follows this girl, Violet, who is entering into this war college for dragon rights. As you can imagine, the survival rate for this college, it's not in the students' favor, as through training, they have to endure deadly challenges, bond with dragons that could literally incinerate them at a moment's notice, and survive each other, as students will employ their own type of messed up eugenics to get rid of the weaker writers. I will say you have to give it 100 pages so you can start to understand the universe and the magic system, but it was totally worth it. Do not DNF this within the first 100 pages. I don't know when the last time I read a book that made me verbally say, out loud. Oh my god, this book is so good. I took out my phone while reading this and recorded a few of my reactions because I just needed to talk to somebody about it and tell someone how this book made me feel. I'll insert those right now. What is happening? What is happening to me? I shouldn't be feeling this way. I don't even know how to describe how I'm feeling. Like, I'm excited. This story is so sweet. This book is so good. Oh my god. Talking dragons. I wish they were real. I wish they were real. Okay, I need to piss. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have. Page 187. I think the word I was looking for was giddy. I was kicking and giggling my feet so much throughout this book. Besides writing a super angsty story that was actually really enjoyable and cute, the author was somehow able to simultaneously talk about two things at once, but it wasn't confusing or anything. This is a novel that made me reevaluate every other book I've given five stars. I had to put my life on pause while reading this. My life revolved around finishing this book. I was addicted. I was an addict. I was waiting for my next fix. I'm like getting so excited. Like I need to like calm down. I am kind of scared to start Iron Flame because I've heard that so many people have DNF'd it. So it kind of seems inevitable that's going to be disappointing. I don't know what to do. Is it better to live in the bliss that is Fourth Wing? I don't know, let me know. But this was amazing. I cannot rave about this enough. After Fourth Wing, I needed to take a few days, not only to bask in my love for that book, but to also metaphorically cry. I cried enough in Fourth Wing, so you know, the well was dry, but on the inside I was crying. So I had to wait a few days for the next book to speak to me. What a way to speak of the devil. <laughs> I gave this three and a half stars. I think this is one of those books where the synopsis is better than the actual story. In this novel, we start off with seven women in a hotel room gathered around a severed head. Right there in the middle, yeah, they were just like, you know, form a little circle with it in it. Yeah, that is what was, that's what took place. They don't know what happened to this guy. All they know is that each of them have a motive for wanting him dead. Though each swears that it wasn't them. That's what a guilty person would say though. And so over the book, we follow each of these women along with a detective. So there's eight POVs in total to see why these women are all tangled up with the same man and which one of them would turn to murder. As you can imagine, it did get kind of confusing keeping all the POV straight, especially because there were so many differing storylines going on, which I will say does keep the book interesting in the long run. But over the first 100 pages or so, I had to keep flipping back to the first chapter just so I could like remind myself who was who. I mean, it worked, but it was kind of annoying. There should be like an informal rule for how many POVs you can have. Maybe there is and I don't know, but I'm not a writer. Can we talk about the gaslighting that occurs in this book. This man gaslights every woman he even so briefly glances at. What I'm about to say is not a spoiler because this man literally gaslights everyone, but this reveal in this novel only makes sense if we were to believe that this guy continued to gaslight this specific woman after what should have been the turning point for her happened. But we were never shown that. We were just left to assume that that was the case. This woman's individual story was built up, built up, built up, lots of gaslighting, manipulation, deceit. Climax hits. I have a really good analogy, which I'm not going to use because that would spoil the story. But right, the turning point happens for this individual story. There's lots of individual stories going on. And then we're left dangling. I'm going to rewatch this and be like, Sarah, you make no sense. And I don't want to belittle the manipulation she went through, but it's like, girl, you weren't hallucinating before. So there's no reason to think that you're hallucinating now. How are we supposed to believe that? I will say the character development was really good in here. And I didn't know where the story was heading the whole time. Though looking back, if I just thought a little bit more, I 
probably could have figured it out. But tomato, tomato, potato, potato, am I right? However, the more I think back on this book, the more apparent it becomes that the structure of this novel needed some reworking. In a perfect book, little bits and pieces throughout the novel are all pulled together in the end. But in here, you could just take certain chunks out, mainly the first half of the book, and you would still be able to understand the story. Not terrible. I wouldn't not recommend it. I wouldn't go out of my way to recommend it. Three and a half stars. Okay, let's talk about Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir, which we will just have to visually enjoy as a graphic as I've lent my physical copy out to my brother. As of Easter, he has read a grand total of zero pages, so... It's going great for him. I really enjoyed this book. It was definitely different. It was solid four stars. Part of the fun of this book is learning about everything going on alongside our protagonist. So don't read the synopsis going in. I read the synopsis after I read the book and I was like, yeah, I'm glad that I didn't read this before I read it. So all you should really know going in is that our protagonist wakes up from a medically induced coma on a spaceship and quickly realizes that his crewmates are dead and that he has no idea what his name is, let alone why he is on the spaceship in the first place. This book is written in that kind of quirky writing style, which I thought really worked for it as it made it more accessible because even if you don't understand the science going on, hey, at least it was still entertaining. Did I understand all the science? No. Some of it, yes, all of it, no. The parts I did understand, <sighs> I felt smart. I was like, dang. Ooh, Sarah. I should really get into reading more science fiction because I actually do re like reading about science. It's why I signed up for a medical terminology class this semester. That was a mistake. <laughs> Not doing that again. But although I enjoyed the science aspect, I could have used a bit less of it. The novel was surprisingly wholesome. I was not expecting that, but it also had high stakes and sarcasm that I couldn't personally connect with. Yeah, just mm, wasn't really into it. <laughs> I know a lot of you guys also enjoyed Project Hail Mary, but thoughts on The Martian? Is it worth a read? Let me know. Then I picked up Terms and Conditions by Lauren Asher. Oh, we're kind of matching today. Love that. I did like this significantly more than the fine print. Iris in here, she is my everything. A strong plant loving woman doesn't get much better than that. Declan on the other hand, where's the uh, where's the delete button? Declan took possessiveness to the next level. He definitely gave alpha male vibes. There was this one part where they were cuddling or whatever and Declan admitted to doing something that significantly hindered Iris's professional life and he just brushed it off like it was no big deal. Who does this man think he is? Each book in the Dreamland Billionaire series follows a grandson as they fulfill their assigned task so that they can receive their share of their inheritance from their late grandfather who was basically this fictionalized version of Walt Disney. So in this installment, Declan is tasked with finding a woman and I was gonna say impregnating her. <laughs> No, having a child with her is probably the more appropriate saying, but basically impregnating her. You see, this family is very troubled with love. So the grandfather is like, no, I don't want my grandchildren to go to therapy. Why would I sign them up for that? No, I'm just going to force love on them and hope that that fixes their deeper issues. He's clearly a bit Delulu, but he, Okay, my favorite character in the series, besides Iris, of course, is Cal, the third brother, whose story is in the third book, but we did get a lot of him in this novel as he is Iris's best friend. Really, they should've just gotten together. That would've been the dream duo right there. But I'm excited to read his story in the next book. <laughs> It's like, I just like complained about this novel for like two minutes straight. And then I'm like, yeah, I'm so excited to read the next book. The Perfect Child by Lucinda Berry. I gave four and a half stars. This novel is about this girl, Janie, who is found abandoned in a park, severely malnourished and abused, causing her to need some pretty intense physical and mental healing. Janie's parents are gone. We don't really know what happened to them, but luckily for Janie, two doctors are looking into adopt her. But despite warnings from child services, Christopher and Hannah are like, we're doctors. We would be the best fit for her to, you know, help her heal and everything. However, upon bringing her home and learning more about Janie's past, it quickly becomes clear that this little girl is hiding something underneath that sweet facade. The topics of this book were so painfully real at times, but I really appreciated how this shed light on the harsh reality of the foster care system. One of the big questions over the book is whether Janie's behavior is justified. Like, can you really blame her after everything she's been through? Still, I would not be able to put up with some of the things she did. Most of the things this little girl does. And one of these things I saw coming, I saw it coming, but it didn't make it any less horrific. And especially after that incident, I would be scared, scared for my life by a little girl 
Mm hmm That is precursor psychopath behavior. Janie is probably one of the most horrifying children I have ever read. Lucinda Berry is actually a former clinical psychologist, so the psychological themes and commentary in her books is always fantastic. This book is very bingeable, and I enjoyed it a lot. March's prompts for the buzzword readathon. I'm really enjoying the buzzword readathon, if you can't tell. It's a lot of fun, but it was to read a book with a character name in the title, so I thought Vera Wong's unsolicited advice for murderers would fit the bill quite nicely. I say this all the time, but there's something so wholesome and cute about elderly people solving crimes. In this novel, we have Vera, owner of this rundown tea shop in San Francisco. Now, Vera takes after my own heart as she's very routine oriented. Specifically, she has this morning routine she follows to the dime every morning. And it is on one of these mornings where she finds a dead man in her tea shop. Now, Vera is like, I can either call the police and let them investigate this crime, or I can investigate and ensure everything is looked into. Because clearly, as a tea shop owner, she's qualified to do that. I'll let you guess what she chooses. Before reading this novel, I never realized how intricate and complex making tea can be. Like how making different types of coffee and exploring coffee is a passion to some people me. The same thing can be said about tea for others. I have a deeper level of appreciation for tea now, and I kind of want to do some more research and become my own type of tea guru. <laughs> I want to have my own tea journey. So the dead guy in here has a twin who is nothing like him. The twin's a side character, but their dynamic really reminded me of the twins in Dead to Me. If you haven't seen that show, basically there's an innocent good twin and then the complete opposite devil incarcerated twin. But I'm saying this because James Masden played those characters. And so I kept picturing him as not only the dead guy, but also the twin. I don't know if this is just me, but I really love it when books describe in detail characters. For me, it makes the reading experience more immersive. I know that some people like to imagine whomever they want, but I don't want to have to do work when I read. <laughs> reading for the most part is when I give my brain a break. This is a cozy mystery, so it was pretty formulaic, but there were still a few twists and turns that caught me off guard. The Good Sister by Sally Hepworth. I gave four and a half stars. Apparently I've given a lot of thrillers four and a half stars these past couple of months, which I'm totally fine with. Like those are the type of thrillers I want to be reading. 90% of this book was very strong. I loved it a lot. It was shaping up to be a five star. However, we were building up to this final intense moment that never really happens. Still, I wouldn't let that stop you from picking this up. Fern, whom we follow primarily over the novel, is such an interesting character. She is a very analytical and literal person that often uses rules to help her with social interactions. So for example, she viewed conversations as two people asking questions back and forth. So whenever someone would make a statement rather than a question, she would just stare at them and just like not answer. Just let it hang. Honestly, she was so real for that. Fern also had this deep passion for spreading her love of literature, which I love seeing, and if you're a part of the book community, I'm sure is very relatable. The codependency portrayed in this book was captivating, concerning, made me grateful that I don't have a sister like that. This book also explored family dynamics, it had a bit of romance, everything that makes up a good domestic thriller. If you are a thriller lover, this is definitely a must read. All right, Milk Fed by Melissa Brudder. I gave this two and a half stars. Uh, I'm kind of at a loss for words. This was interesting, but not like interesting, but like interesting, like interesting. This book was very Freudian, if you know what I mean. And personally, that's not for me. The two and a half stars in here were for the commentary, which was thought out to some extent. It could have gone deeper, but I appreciated the unique perspective. Parts of this book are now seared into my brain and I wish they were not. I would say I like weird books every now and then, but uh, I don't want to be unintentionally judge judgmental, but this was, this was just, uh, uh, this was just a bit too weird for me. I didn't like it, okay? and I have to speak my truth. Lastly, I finished off March with A Welcome Reunion by Lucinda Berry, which is the sequel to A Perfect Child that takes place about 10 years in the future. The story was just as thrilling as the first, but overall it still felt half-baked. Like if you baked a cake and took it out of the oven with the center still raw and jiggly and then sold it to the bakery anyways. There were also a few too many grammatical errors, which did not help the I wrote this in one sitting without a second read through 
feeling. But I still enjoyed it enough. I gave it three and a half stars. And I would recommend if you liked the first novel, especially since it's only like 66 pages, but like I still read in three sittings. I'll know what happened at the end of the month. Uh, you could definitely read this in one go. All right, so that is what I've been reading over these past couple of months. Let me know down in the comments what books you've been reading recently. Any thoughts, hot takes? I'd love to hear it. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. It really does help me mention it a lot. You can also comment, interact, subscribe, all that fun YouTube stuff. I'd really appreciate it. I hope you all are having a fantastic week and I've had a fantastic reading month and I will see you in my next video. Bye.